Fraser, and um, he's going to be taking through us, taking us through some portfolio stuff, some CV writing, um, and just all things architecture in the future and the looking at jobs and all that kind of stuff. So I'll just pass you over to Fraser, and he will introduce himself and what we're going to be talking about tonight. Uh, cheers, Ross. Thanks for that. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, I am Fraser Doherty. Um, I'm a part two architectural assistant and urban designer with Austin Smith Lord. Um, and I was asked uh, by ADAS just to talk a little bit about CVs and portfolios and uh, and hopefully use uh, the session today um, to give you guys a, a glimpse into um, what you might do for your year out if you're uh, considering applying for jobs after university. Um, when you're graduating as well. Um, so this is mainly targeted at third years going on to the year out and also uh, prospective graduates in the summer. Um, but also, you know, first, second year's really good opportunity to um, use this workshop as an opportunity to gleam a little bit about um, doing an internship maybe over summer. Uh, so hopefully we'll, uh, we'll give you some new information and, uh, and just build up some skills. Um, so, a little bit about me. Um, I started university in 2012. Um, I, despite this picture, I really enjoyed first year of uni. Um, but uh, I think, yeah, adjusting to that freshers kind of life um, was, it took its toll on uh, Thursday lectures for sure. Um, to give you a bit of background, in second year, I actually um, struggled um, with uni. Uh, Joseph Thurrett was uh, my year lead. You can see uh, Joe and I there really pally in that photograph. Um, I, I failed second year. I had to reset in summer. Um, but fear not, came back third year and uh, got into my, my year out, got, got it all sorted and began to get my act together, I would say. Still struggling to adjust to that, um, that balanced lifestyle at uni. Um, fourth year... Uh, well, before fourth year, rather, uh, I did my year out with uh, John Fulani Architect, uh, which is in Dundee. Um, there's a few uh, of the, the current uh, stock at university that, um, that have uh, used that well-trodden path. Um, and, uh, and that was my, my first real insight of industry for a, a prolonged um, period of time. Uh, I stayed in Dundee. Um, just because I was comfortable there. A lot of my friends did other courses and um, and it was something that I, I just wanted to stay um, in that environment uh, with my mates. Uh, although, uh, you know, the, the year out is a real opportunity to uh, to go abroad, obviously. So um, maybe a bit more on that uh, later on. Um, fourth year, again, uh, came back invigorated, um, was looking forward to, to uni. Um, coming back and being a bit more creative after the, the year out. Um, but yeah, uh, I, I kind of knuckled down in fourth year uh, despite that picture and uh, I managed to, to do really well and then eventually graduated in fifth year. So the, the point I'm trying to make here is that, you know, if you are struggling uh, to get to grips with things, that's OK. And, um, you know, you will get there and you will graduate. Uh, trust me, I'm, uh, I'm living proof. So um, post-graduation, I went back and worked with John Fulani Architects for a year. I wasn't really sure uh, what I wanted to do. Um, I thought about travelling. I thought about maybe taking a bit of time out from architecture. But uh, but it was it, it was good for me just to um, go back and work locally while I tried to figure things out. Uh, luckily, John was a very understanding boss. Um, and then I moved to Austin Smith Lord in Glasgow. Um, I, I should have said in fifth year, I did the uh, joint masters. So I did um, architecture and urban planning uh, and Austin Smith Lord uh, happened to be a, an urban design firm. Uh, so um, more aligned to, to really uh, my qualifications. And then uh, this year, I mean, I've been at home um, as, as has everybody. Um, I was actually furloughed uh, for a time. So played lots of golf, watched lots of Netflix, but I also thought about future and, and started looking at uh, CVs and portfolios for about the third or fourth time. Um, so I suppose that this is a, a kind of natural um, a natural thing for me to do is to, to speak about this job um, 
application process because uh, I've got a little bit of experience in it. Now, I don't uh, profess to be an expert by any means. So, um, you know, uh, I just hope that uh, this can be a useful uh, session for you all. So uh, on to the actual workshop. Uh, that's enough about me. Um, aims of tonight is to simplify the process fundamentally for you guys, hopefully make it a little bit easier and more manageable. To give you confidence about your year out and uh, graduation, I know that it's the, the the last of your concerns right now is thinking about a job, potentially. You're, you're that involved in your studies in semester two can be really difficult. Um, but hopefully this gives you a little bit of confidence going into that period over summer. Um, hopefully provide you an overview of how to piece together things um, out with um, the, the university environment in, uh, in architecture. And uh, we're going to cover the CV, first of all, the portfolio, and then how to go about job applications. OK, so there's three kind of natural breaks in this session, and um, I'll, I'll invite questions at those points. So once we've been through CVs, uh, once we've been through portfolio, and finally, job applications. Um, I will stress that this is a workshop, so please, uh, the last thing I want to do is to be um, going on, wittering on. So uh, please jump in if you've got any questions. I know that Ross and I think Glenn are manning the chat line as well. So uh, guys, just interrupt uh, if a question comes up. And I am hoping that this will be um, a kind of a Q&A session. Um, I would invite contributions uh, and, and hopefully, um, you know, you guys can share your thoughts because this is about really you guys using this opportunity and to get information on uh, on what to do applications wise. OK, so um, broadly, portfolio and CV, the best way to get a template, which is really important, is um, is to do a quick Google search or Pinterest. I'm sure you've all used Pinterest before. It sounds really basic, but keyword searches are, are important for this, you know, CV design. Uh, architecture portfolio examples, just keyword searches um, to help you on uh, piecing together a template idea. Um, so first off, the, the CV, um, where to start, I suppose. Um, keep your CV really concise, uh, one to two pages max, A4 sheets. Um, or an A3 spread combined. So, you know, if you've got two A4 portraits, pop them together. Um, be really brief. The, the CV is just a quick example of you. It's, it's not war and peace. Um, establish a list of what you want um, to, to convey in your, uh, your CV. That's where to start. So actually just think about uh, what you want to get across to a potential employer because it is the first time that they're going to see you. Um, start to use InDesign. I know you guys are probably all using InDesign now. If you're not, don't worry. Uh, I was saying to Ross last week that I did my first CV where I got a job. <laughs> um, I got a, I did it in Word. So, you know, you, you can use Word if, if you want, but uh, I would start to use InDesign and it's a great opportunity to, um, to use the software. Okay. Um, Try and work out what you're interested in and match it to practices that you're interested in. More on that in a bit. Um, and this is really about tailoring uh, applications um, that you're passionate about and, and matching them to you. Uh, last thing I'll say on this is choose colour wisely and, and more on that in a, in a second. Um, as I said, employer's first impression of you is the CV, so it is pretty important. So, when you go on to Pinterest and you, you type in CVs, this is the kind of thing that you'll see. Now, the first thing I would say is don't be suckered in by the first example. Look through them. You know, actually take the time to go through examples of CVs. And um, there's lots of different examples. Um, I've just picked out a few here. Um, but start to think about, you know, what are these really showing? Um, you'll notice with this example, uh, yeah, there's a lot of information on it, but uh, all of the uh, the headings are similarly weighted. There's no hierarchy, for example. Um, this one's slightly different. It's a bit neater. It's not as garish, but 
um, they've not included a, a photo. Again, personal choice. Um, I would say this one's uh, a little bit more professional looking. Um, I don't know what your guys' opinion is, uh, but yeah, there, there's lots of different ways of really doing the same thing, if you like. These have all got the same information on them, but they're telling a slightly different story. And fundamentally, you're trying to convey to an employer um, that you've got the best story. So, you know, your CV is really important for that. Um, the one on the right here, a little bit more stripped back, um, but again, quite punchy, quite graphic. Uh, so you really need to consider how employers might view your CV in a pile, okay? Um, it's all well and good looking at them individually, but when you start to see them stacked up, you know, is yours going to stand out? So what stands out immediately? Number one, um, a number of applications are going to be viewed by employers, especially if you're going for and um, kind of higher end practices. So, uh, so really make sure that you take the time for your uh, for your CV. Uh, do the pile test. So um, try and think of your CV in a pile and imagine would it stand out just by its design and its layout. So the example here is uh, on the right, you know, you've got a really nice um, CV at the, the front here, but it's just not as graphically punchy as the others. And could potentially be lost. So consider that. Um, where do you want the employer's eye to be drawn? That's important as well. So what, what is the key information that you want the employer to see? Okay, is it your job title? Is it the type of job that you're looking for? And um, it's certainly not your contact information or your, um, you know, your early days at school. So really try and focus on, um, on how you show that information. Is it too subtle or too garish? And does it send the right message? Just on that, it should reflect yourself. And the good thing is you're in total control of this, okay? So uh, I'll put this to everybody. This is a workshop, so I'd invite comment. What do people think stands out about the two examples in front of me just now? And uh, you can come off mute or if you're not feeling up to it, um, just uh, just drop it in the chat line and, and maybe Ross can mention it. Any ideas, guys? Just jump in, honestly. Who's going to be first? <laughs> they both got a very... Um they've gone for the, the sort of the sidebar and then the content kind of organization. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's definitely a, something that I would advise you to do. And um, you'll notice the one on the right is probably a bit better in that where it, it kind of, it has a hierarchy, if you like. The work experience is wider and that's that's the kind of meat of what you're trying to do. Um, and the the less important things are, are down the side with the bar. You'll notice the one on the left is quite garish, maybe. Um, is there anything else that, that people are picking up on? Um, I think I can see some stuff coming in the chat, maybe. Infographics, yeah, yeah. Um, that's a good point, Lucy. Um, yeah, the text could be too hard to read. That That's a good point as well. So try and think about all of these little details, you know, what is your eye drawn to with, with this one? The, the color is quite good, I would say. Um, the, the skills are really clear to see. I, I'm not a fan of personally putting, um, you know, a bar on, on skills, but, um, you know, each to their own. I, I, think, I think it's a clear way for an employer to see where you think your strengths lie and where you think you, you maybe got a weakness. Um, is there anything else that's, that's jumping out, guys? More information um, on the right-hand side. Yeah, exactly. I would agree. I think the one on the left is weaker. Um, fundamentally, that's what you should take away from this. Um, another example, uh, if I move on. What do you guys think of these? Do you think these two examples are better than the last two? And flood the comments, guys. I, I really don't mind this. It's a workshop session, so feel free to uh, butt in, you know, and share your ideas. 
yeah, a lot clearer, right? More information, but feel less inclined to read. Okay, so that's an interesting point. Some people prefer their CVs to be really stripped back and just have key information on it. Um, I would argue that because it's such a small uh, layout size and, and it's an A4 sheet, you are wanting to use the space as much as you can. So um, it's probably quite important to, to get as much information on it as you can. But as I say, you need to be concise with it. Um, I don't know uh, what, what you guys think, but I'm personally more drawn to the one on the left because I think it's snappier. However, um, the, there's a pastel kind of vibe going on with the one on the right that I think would suit certain practices. And that's something that's really important to, to consider. The practices that you're going to be applying for, does your work tie into um, to their style? Yeah, I would agree, Chloe. So yeah, that, that's that's just an, another two examples. Um, if I pull up the next one, now this one again very stripped back, um, but this is an example of a of a two sided um, CV where they've got their kind of main information on the left um, and then just expansive information on the right hand side. It's a good opportunity as well to mix it up where you take off your contact details and education and add extra information about yourself. So interests, um, examples maybe could include things like awards that you've won. And if you've, if you've got a, a few awards, get them on a CV. Uh, you'll notice references are on this one. Um, so I would advise that broadly, uh, this is a good style um, you might not like the, uh, the the design necessarily because it, I would say it's maybe a little bit pastely and, and not quite as impactful as maybe the, the previous example on the left. Uh, but again, all the information is very clear. Um, it's, it's clear the who the person is. I think adding the photograph helps because it just personalizes it. Again, personal preference. Um, but really think about how just factors in these templates might start to inform how you might put together your CV. Okay, so this example, what does everyone think of this? Um, now I'm conscious that the um, what I've shown here is a CV on the left and a cover letter on the right, but what's standing out to you guys really? I've, you know, Again, put it in the chat and uh, and we can start to go into this in maybe a little bit more detail. That left hand column again is like very punchy. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, potentially this is the best use of colour that we've seen. Um, I'm not a big fan of the, the, the plants going on and, and drifting in, in the corner, but um, very punchy and um, it's very clear um, what the education is, snappy, skills are easy to read and um, the, the, the contrast is really significant I would say in this, contrasting colour is exactly Erin. Um, the, uh, the example here I would say that the thing to really know is that it's very punchy and, and an impactful CV is going to stand out in front of, you know, more pastely um, examples that we've been through previously. Okay, so if we take this example, the key takeaways then, it's professional. It's clearly been done by someone who's in design, who knows what they're doing and is quite happy to show that they know what they're doing. And again, I would make that point that that's really important with a CV. It's the first thing an employer will read. So it has to have that, that impact. The author's taken time to lay it out. That's clear. Um, and that helps the employer. You know, they, they understand that immediately and, uh, and they don't have to go trawling through it to see the relevant information. As we've said, I think everybody's 
maybe commented or maybe taken a mental note that's punchy and impactful. And it's simple, very, very simple. Um, it sounds really basic, but the fact that it's aligned, uh, you'd be surprised how many CVs or portfolios are all over the place and and they're not um, they're not structured well. Um, well, you know, there it is. And, and that just shows that the person takes care in what they're doing and, uh, and again, gives that good first impression. Um, and what we we're talking about earlier, there's consistency with the cover letter and CV, which is, again, quite a nice touch and something to think about. Um, final point I would make on that is, yeah, colour used very well, sparingly, and, uh, and, and creates that hierarchy. OK. So the profile of the CV, if you like, if we break it down, the top of the, the piece is your name and your professional title. Now, that's really important, especially in architecture, because you might be applying for an urban design role uh, when you graduate. Uh, you might be applying for an interior design role when you uh, graduate. Um, architecture is a really good degree for getting generally involved in design. So make that clear, the professional title that you're after. Um, I would also make the point, um, make it relevant to the job that you're applying to. If you're applying for a, an architectural assistant job, um, make that clear in the title beneath your name. Um, so that's a great opportunity. Uh, you'll notice underneath that there's, there's a little blurb. This is really good for positioning your CV, okay? Um, if I use my example, uh, I wouldn't say that it's, it's as good as the example on the left, but just to broadly contextualize it, um, use that profile piece to draw attention to you. So immediately I'm setting out, I'm a master's graduate, so tick that box, in architecture and urban planning. So instantly that's a unique qualification that I've drawn attention to. I graduated in 2018, so that's telling um, an employer that, okay, I've been in the industry a little while, um, and I graduated with this distinction. So boom, instantly you're selling yourself. The next part of that, Speak about you. What are you like as a person? What conditions do you like to work in? Do you have a passion for community consultations? Do you have a passion for um, specific aspects of design? Are you a, a detail fanatic? Uh, draw attention to what you're interested in in this profile section. That's really, really important. Um, we've just been through a number of templates. The templates are great but you need to fill them with impactful information. Finally, what I would say about this uh, profile is at the end, tie it back to the job and what you're interested in. So in this case, uh, when I graduated, I was applying for uh, urban design roles. So I was really interested in using my dual qualification and, uh, and placemaking. And um, urban design is all about looking at things um, you know, in a, a broader context and placemaking is really important to that. Um, so yeah, that, that's just a, a broad kind of overview of how to make that profile as punchy as you can. And as you can see, like the example, I've got my contact information, my LinkedIn. Um, on InDesign, you can hyperlink that up, quick Google search, you'll be able to do that. So the employer, if they're viewing it as a PDF, they can check out your InDesign um, credentials as well. So examples of experience. If I was to relate this to me, uh, which again should help contextualize things for you guys, I would be saying that I'm a part two architectural assistant and urban designer. Draw attention to the fact that it's specifically part two because uh, you don't want to be uh, having an employer thinking that you're a part one um, just because of your, your standing and where you're at. So make that clear. Um, for the third years, you know, you guys will have part one in that and uh, and that just makes it clear that you're applying for part one roles. Um, a little blurb about what you do day to day is uh, is important and, and what you're interested in. So I really enjoy public engagement events and uh, I'm responsible for a lot of that in my day to day work. So uh, I would draw attention to that because those are the type of roles that I'm interested in. Um, 
Another example that I would potentially use in work experience is uh, I contributed to a public consultation following my master's. Um, so draw attention to things that you've gone out and sought. You know, if you've done a, a project and it's been picked up by someone, a member of the community, draw attention to that. You know, that shows that you're a, a go-getter and it shows that you're uh, you're willing to do more than just the syllabus, if you like. Um, more about that, you guys might be thinking, I've, I've never worked as a part two. I've, I've never done a public consultation. That's OK. Um, have you helped with teaching? Have you helped in design crits? As a third year, you might be really interested in uh, tutoring. So you might have asked to help out with first year uh, crits. Draw attention to that. Um, if you did it uh, only once, just just put the month, uh, you know, in the in the little date corner there. They don't have to know that you've only done it once, you know. Just draw attention to the fact that you've sought out an opportunity. Again, other things you can put. I was a hockey coach um, in my master's year, and it, it helped. <laughs> if if I'm totally honest, to uh, come away from the uh, the rigors, I suppose, of academia. But draw attention to that, you know, it shows that you can time manage. Um, student ambassador, do you help out with the uni? That's another thing. And uh, another professional experience. In third year, no one's expecting you to have been a part-time tutor or, you know, a hockey coach or have done ambassador roles with the university. So if you have done anything like that, draw attention to it. Um, it's an example that you've worked uh, part time or or that you've been able to to have a job whilst balancing uh, a tricky course like architecture. So really use all these examples. As I said at the start, write a list of what you are as a person, you know, what your experience is, what you're interested in and try and get that across in your CV. OK. Key snapshot information, this is pretty self-explanatory, but if I was to relate it to me, I would note my education um, kind of starting more recently because that's your best qualification and then working back. Some people don't show the, the um, you know, what they got in their, their hires. You know, it would be enough just to put your, your grades, for example. Um, but yeah, it, it just it gives people a general overview um, an employer's an idea of, of what your attainment's like. Um, now, this example's got skills. I would say core software is more uh, kind of usable in architecture, if you like. So um, AutoCAD. Now, the previous examples that I showed, um, they had, um, you know, little graphics, um, little, uh, it, it was like five dots, and they, they filled the dots to show how competent or proficient uh, they were in that software. I would just simply put the years that you've used it. If I've been using AutoCAD for nine years, I would be expecting to be pretty good at it. Um, plus, you're not committing to saying you're an expert, and you're also not committing to saying, mm, I don't know, I, I don't know that I'm very good at that. If someone sees that you've been doing a, a program for a year or six months, they'll know that you won't be as good as someone that's been doing it for 10 years. So that's a, a little cut around for that. I was speaking about it before. What sets you apart as a as a graduate or or as a a person applying for a job? Get down anything that you've done that is to do with a leadership role or a role that you've pursued over and above your studies. You might be a great student, but we don't just want to see what you do modules wise. We want to understand what you're like as a person. An employer is. Uh, hiring for the good of their company after all and they want rounded people so you know are you part of a sports club are you a captain of a, a sports team and um, are you a, an active member in a society are you a, a chairman or a secretary or a tour convener get all of that stuff down because again it shows that you're willing to go out and pursue things and uh, and that you're a rounded individual you're not just sitting at a computer up to all hours and, uh, and and throwing yourself into architecture, show that you're a rounded individual. Um, key professional skills as well. 
are you good at hand drawing? Are you good at physical model making? Are you particularly skilled at laser cutting? Don't just show examples of that in your portfolio uh, visually, which we'll come to, but actually get it down. You know, own what you're good at. Um, it's quite a, it's, it's an un-British thing, I think. Uh, particularly Scottish people tend to put themselves down. And uh, I think, you know, you need to, you need to really advocate yourself. Um, because if you don't, uh, the, the employer certainly isn't. And then other skills, uh, you know, do you play football? Do you play hockey? Do you play golf? You'll be amazed at the amount of uh, interviews that you'll go into. And the first thing that a question uh, is asked, and the first time a question is asked, rather, is about your personal life. Oh, I see you play golf. What's your handicap? And employers use that to, to get you into an interview and, and to get you settled. But they also want to know about you and how you can contribute. Um, you know, an example, golf, golf is a great networking thing. Get that down if if you're into golf. Um, UK driver's license. In my first job, um, my boss actually said to me that I would have been more employable if I had a, a driver's license. So that's important as well if you're going out on surveys and, and that kind of thing. Okay, so just broadly going through the CV then. These are the takeaways, I would say, right? Be clear and concise and always, always, always get someone to look over your work. The amount of times I've sent a CV away and I've realised a spelling mistake, you cannot take that back. Send it to your dad, send it to your gran, send it to your mum, get your flatmate to check it, get your other flatmate to check what your flatmate's checked. I guarantee you it will not be... Um, a waste of time. You'll always get them pointing something out and, and raising something. You've got to grab the reader's attention with that key statement at the start. So really work on that. I would say fine tune that the most. Um, your work experience should always begin with the most recent. As I was saying, if you don't have that architecture experience, no modules that you feel you did well in, want to draw attention to, or uh, or, or you feel were significant to how you've developed and uh, and also no part-time jobs. As I say, a lot of your third years on this call, I believe, you're not going to have the architecture industry experience. If you do, fantastic. If you don't, it doesn't matter. Put down that you're a, a part-time waiter, um, you know, that you're a barman. Again, it just shows that you're more well-rounded. Um, it's really obvious, guys, but use those column widths to um, establish that hierarchy. Um, yeah, I was talking about it before. OK, yeah, you play university sports. If you're going to make the point of using that in the main body of your portfolio or your CV, you need to demonstrate how that makes you a better person. So teamwork, it shows that you can um, manage your time. Um, it shows that you work well in a group. Um, Part-time job shows you're proactive. Um, it shows that you're you, you want to earn money. You know, it's it's all pluses. So it sounds obvious, but again, draw attention to it and be efficient with the space. Too much blank space isn't good on a CV because you're trying to get across as much information um, as concisely as possible. Um, and then finally, references. I've seen people put four and five references on a CV. It's a waste of space. Get two, two maximum. One, one is fine, especially uh, you know at part one level. Some employers ask for a certain amount of references, but um, yeah, I, I would say two, two is general rule of thumb. Get a tutor, but also get someone like maybe a teacher. Um, don't just stick to tutors and um, have a, an employer. Maybe um, if you work in a, a cafe, ask your manager. If you work in Tesco, similarly, ask the, the store manager to, to just give you a reference. OK. Now, is there any questions on the CV? Um, I'm conscious that that's maybe been I'm trying to stick to about 20 minutes on these. So that's the CV dealt with. And um, has anyone got any questions? Please, guys, do not be. Uh, frightened because this is your opportunity to um, to get as much information from this session as possible. 
Um, I think we ask how much you would tailor the CV, um, and would that mainly be in the profile sort of part of it towards like a certain firm or a certain type of job, for example? Yeah, exactly right, Ross. If I uh, if I just go back to that uh, example that I was given up at the top, yeah, your experience broadly is not going to change depending on who you're applying for, right? But your profile will. So match that to the job description. If the job description is asking for someone who's really passionate about engagement, note that you're passionate about engagement. It's the first thing they will read after reading your title. Um, and it, it will you'll be surprised at uh, how far that goes. So really good point, actually. Um, I'm just checking the chat line here. Uh, let me know if I'm missing anything, but uh, anything you'd have not done on the CV is a four size preferred. OK, so um, I would say there are previous examples most of them, they're, they generally follow the same template. Now, there's a reason for that because it's a tried and tested way. I would say, personally, I uh, I wouldn't uh, do the um, the dots, uh, you know, that this kind of thing. I don't I don't think it's a good way. I think it's a great way of showing that you're good at something, but I think it's a a really obvious way of showing an employer that you aren't. Uh, good at something and that for me is a weakness so I wouldn't show that don't get me wrong there was there, there will be people that think they're amazing at things and they're not and I just think it sets you up for a fall especially uh, if you get a job you know someone could turn around and say well you said you were five out of five at CAD and you're clearly not so I would say I would do it in years and you know drawing attention to uh, the, the example that I showed uh, I just think it's a better way of doing it. Um, I'll just check the chat again. Um, also, A4 size, yes, that is preferred, I would say. A4 size is great. if You'll generally have an A3 portfolio. Um, so if you combine two A4s together, that makes an A3, obviously. So it's a good way of having two spreads. Uh, treat it like that, or uh, or a one spread, uh, sorry, a, a single A4 with a cover letter as your other A4. It just uh, it comes across quite quite punchy, and I, I wouldn't use uh, I wouldn't use A3 for a uh, for a CV. It's it's just too big. The, the text will end up being massive. Um, how far back should work experience cover? Yeah, that's a really good point, Jess. Uh, I would say. Even if you've had better experience, um, sorry, even if you've had more recent experience that hasn't been as good, I would draw attention to what you feel has been the most valuable experience. So if you had a job at 16 that you thought, I got loads out of that and it's really relevant, I would make a point of that over a, a job that you've had for a month, let's say. But you can do that in a number of ways. So um, again, if I go back to this example, um, I had a lot of examples of things that I'd, I'd done extracurricular wise and uh, and I'd, I'd done other things. So draw attention to other things that you've done, list them, but just don't go into as much detail about them. Uh, set up a hierarchy in that regard. And that's just an easy way of showing, yeah, I've got loads of experience, but this is what I'm going to draw attention to. Uh, hopefully that's clear. Um, so Erin's saying, do you recommend emailing posting? Now, that's a really good point. I think COVID has actually given you you guys a, a really good opportunity in many ways. If you have a practice that you think is really high on your list, I would send them a, a direct post or hand something in. Obviously, in this COVID situation, you guys will probably still be applying for jobs in summer and it'll, it'll be everything online. Uh, but I would say if there's a local practice that you're really keen on, put your head in the door. If you have the confidence to go out and do that, again, it sets you apart. Every aspect of what you're trying to do in your CV and your portfolio is about setting you apart. Okay, so yeah, I would I would focus on anything that you can do um, to, to improve the likelihood of you getting a job. So if it is handing something in directly, I would do it. 
if you're handing out 50 CVs to 50 different companies, uh, that's just too much of a chore for me. So I would be selective about that, Heather. Yeah. Um, is that everybody's questions? Uh, feel free to pop off onto your microphone, guys, as well, honestly. Um, I won't bite. <laughs> Is that everything, Ross, do you think? Yeah, I think, I think that's everything um, that's come through so far. Great, okay. Right, so, guys, I'll uh, I'll kick on with the portfolio if uh, if you're okay with that. So the dreaded portfolio I've put in brackets, because this, this is scary for people. Um, and I say it's scary from personal experience. Uh, you'll laugh at this, but when I was, uh, when I'd left university and I'd gone back to work for my previous employer, I uh, I took off days to work on my portfolio because I was being lazy about it and I just I had to take days off to, to focus on getting it done. And uh, one thing I would say, template is so important. So once you've got your CV template sorted, which is a little bit easier and not quite as big and overwhelming, try and match it to your portfolio. It shows consistency, uh, but it also gives you parameters uh, to start from. So on that, where do you start? So the big thing is try and enjoy the process. As I say, it is daunting to put together this big report that you're going to hand out to big employers and, and you can get overwhelmed by it. But don't. Try and enjoy it. It's your opportunity to sell yourself and it's your opportunity to put your best work on show. Again, I can't stress this enough. Be concise. Your portfolio isn't an example. Everything you've done first to third year, uh, every little diagram you've done, it is a highlight reel. So concentrate on content and concentrate on keeping it concise. Pick your best examples of things. So the, the best example, let's say, of uh, a sketch or the best example you've got of a, a, a CAD drawing. Anything you put in your portfolio is going to be scrutinized. So make sure that it's good and also make sure that it's your best, OK? And I would, I would add to that, yeah, make it specific to what you're interested in because, uh, again, employers are going to look at your portfolio and they're going to try and match it to them. So what are you interested in and, and how does that match the practices that you're interested in? Um, drawing on the, the point I made earlier, tailor your applications, okay? Um, that really makes them stand out, whether it's handing them in uh, to the point made earlier or... Uh, just making them align to the practices kind of overall image. I, I would I would say that's well worth it. Use visuals and diagrams. Do not fill it with text. This is not a design report. You will have design reports and you'll be so tempted to say, right, I've done all this work on this design report. I'm going to put it in a portfolio. Employers will see text and they will not read it and they will be put off by it because it shows that you cannot concisely uh, distill your ideas into a sequence of diagrams or visuals. So it's really important, okay? Work to a template. Match it, I would say, to your CV and you're on to a winner. Okay, start with a CV. If you're not particularly savvy on InDesign, use the CV to really get to grips with InDesign and then uh, you'll be flying for when you do your portfolio. Again, colour, use it wisely, sparingly, it's all about your work. It's nothing to do with colour, this. The CV is more about colour because it's wordy and it's got a lot of uh, text in it, whereas this is about images, okay? So if I was to give you an example, um, now you guys can comment on this after I've been through it, so keep an eye out. Tell me what you think you would do differently. Tell me what you think works, okay? Now, I'm just going to go through this broadly and hopefully you guys are going to point out uh, what uh, are the kind of features of it. So this would be an example of um, an initial snapshot of a project. OK, so you'll see there's a little bit of text in the corner about the project. Uh, so this, for example, was a fourth year project that I did. Now. There's a tiny bit of text there, and all that is to do is to contextualize for the reader if they want to understand what the project background was. Then it's about images. Concept first. What was your concept? How did the concept build up your project? And then look at it. 
well, how did that impact your design, let's say, and then your your general drawings? On your year out, when you work in practice, you're going to be doing a lot of general drawings. Show CAD. Don't be afraid to show CAD, but supplement it with diagrams, okay? You want this to be a visual feast. I will make the point that this example is a double spread. It's a landscape um, A4 portfolio. Um, you could print it off A3 as well, I suppose, but um, it would be read individually. So that maybe gives you a, a better understanding of the, the text to visuals. Text is only to supplement the visuals. Um, so this was the overall concept for the, the scheme. It was about looking at how the individual is, uh, is concentrated on for the, for the design of the project. It's all about the individual and then building out to a wider community feel um, and a range of typology um, types um, make up this general village arrangement. So that's the concept. Then how does that concept apply to what you've actually drawn, what the general arrangements are? Give an overview of what your scheme is. Then go into examples of your work. So this was my best example of a CAD drawing in fourth year. Um, really simple. Um, uh, it didn't have any annotation on it. You can tell by the furniture if you look closely what's a bedroom, what's a living room. It was more about just conveying an idea from a concept. Um, then next to that would be what those rooms actually look like. So again, minimal text, all about a snapshot of this was the, the 2D drawing and this is how it's populated in 3D. Another example from this project was the, the, a community centre was a part of it. Again, your employer doesn't need to know that a community centre was an example of it. If they look at the earlier um, graphic, they can find that there is a community centre, but that point isn't important. What is important is the layering of skills. So tech, you can sketch. Tech, you can make a model. Uh, tech, you use it as part of your experimental process, your design process. Show what your design ethos is. You know, make that a part of your portfolio. As much as it's a picture book, it's an example of how you work. So, yeah, you've got these CAD images and, and screen grabs, but, you know, do you make models? If you make models, get them in. Chances are you'll be applying for a model making company. If you sketch a lot, show that you sketch. You're wanting an employer to see what you are really good at. And then finally, this is actually quite a poor graphic, I would say personally, but just showing that through this experimentation process, through model making, through using precedent, through using sketches, you can come up with a, a broad kind of pastel overview of what the space um, will feel like and what the spatial qualities are. And then finally, detailing. Um, I was never a fan of detailing, so you'll notice that my portfolio uh, example here is really graphic. There's a reason for that because I, I'm not as confident with detailing or I wasn't when I was at university. Um, but yeah, get examples of those kind of things in, but make sure that they're your best example of that. Um, so just kind of as an overview, and I would invite comment on this, as a series of spreads, this is how that would look. So you're going from concept, overview design, an example of how you've designed one of these many facets, how you've explored through visuals, sketching, uh, the, the process of making that space, how you've used tools that you've learned at university, modeling, sketching, precedent to inform a design, and then finally, how that relates to detailed design. So in, there's four spreads. Um, you've conveyed a uni project that maybe took eight months. Now, that's quite hard to do, and this could have been a lot better, but hopefully you'll start to see through that that there's a clear 
progression from an idea at the start to a detailed design and kind of key facets in between that make up you as a designer. So hopefully that uh, that gets across the, the portfolio, um, if you like. Uh, guys, feel free to comment just now um, if you have any comments or anything that you don't think is clear and, uh, and hopefully we can go through it. Um, Jay's asking how many pages roughly should your portfolio be? That's a good question. So I would say 20 pages max. And by 20 pages, I would be looking at, uh, I, I'm saying pages, I, I would mean spreads. So if you've got a really visual document that doesn't have a lot of text, that's effectively a picture book, I would say you could have quite a few pages. So you could end up maybe at something like 30 individual pages, but they'll actually read more like 15, if that makes sense. So yeah, these are two pages, but they read as a spread so that they don't seem as uh, as onerous to the, the reader, if you like. Um, but yeah, I would say get it as concise as you can. I would say 20 pages is the absolute max, but uh, you, yeah, I, I think try and get it less than that uh, because it's ultimately about being concise, this, this whole process. Um, is it better to show more projects with less examples or less projects and more work from each? That's a good point. So I would say personal preference. And by that, you might have your best examples of your work might be a CAD plan from a, a second year project, um, a model from a third year project, and, um, and a, a really interesting research piece from a first year project. So if they're your best examples of something, I would use them, first of all. As you get into fourth and fifth year, because you're working on a project for a year or six months or eight months, you will be more inclined to use your whole project um, in, your, in your portfolio. And as I say, trying to go from concept to delivery, because you're trying to show an employer that, that you have that skill. Um, in third year, it's a little bit more open for debate because you're on smaller projects. And as I say, your best examples might be far ranging. So I would say use your best examples each time, no matter which project they're from. But as you develop and maybe get into more of a graduate portfolio, start to look at telling a story. Is that clear? If I haven't answered your question, guys, by the way, probe again, because I, I'm conscious that I could just be talking nonsense. <laughs> OK. Good stuff. Has anyone got any more questions on that? No. If you do, feel free. Go for it. What about um, looking at the, the sort of templates? What about um, if you sort of linked your CV template in with your portfolio um, as a yeah. theme or something? As you know, I've, I've seen stuff like that done before. So interesting point, Ross. I struggled with that when I did my portfolio because you'll see my portfolio is A4 a landscape. So if my CV is in this, it's... Uh, it's not reading as a portrait, It's it would be landscape. So in a job application, I would make the point of sending my CV separately mm -hmm. and, uh, and having my portfolio there. But similarly, um, when you print it off and take it to an interview, let's say, I would have them all together because uh, the eagle-eyed among you will notice that that band there lined through with my profile band in my CV. Oh, yeah. So as that layers up, if a if a person is flicking through a booklet of yours, they will see that you've gone to that effort. Um, but as I say, it's not immediately clear. So think about that. You, you know, when you're putting your portfolio together. In hindsight, I would have done my portfolio portrait because I think it's easier to to read personally. Uh, although it is more of a, a report style, but a lot of my graphics from fourth year 
um, were landscape graphics. So again, they didn't lend themselves to being portrait. Um, our most portfolio is A3 or A4. So the beauty that you've got with your portfolio is that um, they can generally be viewed online. So they don't need to be a specific size for viewing online, as you know. But I would say when you're printing out a portfolio um, and CV and everything, you want something quite consistent. And and just from a, a just a general point of view, if you're lugging it about on trains and things, you want it smaller. So if it can be A4, yeah, great. If it can be um, uh, A3, then that's also a, a, a good way of doing it. But it can just be a, a little bit big. An A3 document is, is big. And one thing to remember, if you've got a, a two spread, uh, sorry, a two page spread for a portrait uh, portfolio, it will be one fully three. So if you've got a particularly big image or a wow image, you might use both pages um, when you're showing that as a PDF. Um, hopefully that makes sense. Um, I've got another question there from Jess that I noticed that I hadn't answered. When applying for part two, would you suggest putting part one year out projects? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I would say ask your employer. Uh, some employers don't mind if it's your work, they, they don't necessarily have to have that you've um, that you've got the logo. If you just credit them just with a little bit of text saying, um, you know, work carried out at, in my case, it would be John Fulani Architect or Austin Smith Lord. Just make a little note of that. And uh, yeah, to your point, Jess, um, definitely include things that you've done on your year out because uh, they'll be that bit different to your, your uni stuff. Um, and you've also said, so the employee knows since some projects were detail oriented. Yeah. And um, yeah, technical detailing is something that you won't have a huge grasp of in third year. You'll do it more in fourth and fifth year. So if you've got stuff from your year out, get it in. The only problem with year out things is they tend to be not as graphically stimulating. So just be careful uh, with, with what you're putting in on that. Um, what's better, an online portfolio or a PDF document? Uh, I would say a PDF document from personal experience. You'll get a lot of job application sites now where they say we do not want uh, external links included. Now, I would always include external links such as my LinkedIn or whatever. But what they're generally drawing attention to there is that people get around having a really concise portfolio by having a massive portfolio that people can see online. So I think for consistency now, employers prefer you to have that concise document and that is it. And um, one thing that will come on to a bit later is that you should have a portfolio that you apply for jobs with that's a snapshot, it's a picture book, and then have a bigger portfolio that you take to an interview that you can talk to because your interview will be longer, number one. And your uh, your interview will also be more about you presenting. So if there's images that you think, oh, goodness, that isn't showing my project fully, get them into an interview portfolio um, to, to just make you confident when you go into an interview to say, hey, actually, I, I didn't include this in my original um, portfolio to you guys, but I, th I think th this is really important. And then tell them why. Um, is it David? Yeah, you, you've said photography. Absolutely. Get that in. I, I had a girl in my year who got employed uh, over three other applicants, and she was told this by her employer six months after starting because she was a photographer. Um, so she actually ended up uh, getting a little bit extra money uh, on top of her salary for being the practices uh, photographer because she included examples of her photography. Similarly, um, I had people in my year that were very good artists. Get art in your portfolio. If you love life drawing, put that in. A lot of uh, progressive practices, especially in London, uh, they do life drawing classes on a monthly basis or a weekly basis, or they'll do sketch classes. If you can show that you've got that skill and that you could potentially step up to do a workshop even, 
they'll be really interested in that. So a really good point uh, and question there, um, David. Apologies if I've got your name wrong. Um, when applying for part one, uh, this is Nathan, um, should we include our grades of past modules? Uh, again, Nathan, that's a that's a valid point. I would include your, your third year degree because in third year, you come out with a bachelor, uh, an ordinary bachelor degree. If you've got a first uh, in that, get that on your CV. I didn't have the luxury of having a first. I had an, a C, I think, in uh, in in the third year. So I didn't I didn't shout about it. I just had my, my B arch noted. But again, we're talking about setting yourself apart. If you're if you've got that grade, get it on. Sell yourself, absolutely. And uh, if you're going for internships, if you're a, a first or second year, if you've got a, a top, if you know you were a top five percent or top ten percent in your year, get it in. Show the employer that yeah, okay, you don't have a um, a third year degree yet, but you're well on track for it, and and you're you're at that level in in your your year group. Similarly, though, don't make it up. I guarantee they would ask a. a a reference on that and, and that could lead to you not getting a job so I would pay attention to that um, Erin you've said do you bring a printed copy of your folio to an interview yes um, I would always take a printed copy of my portfolio um, in fact I've got one sitting here next to me just from previous that I've been to on that I would also take design reports okay uh, that was my fourth year design report. You can see it's massive. Um, I couldn't send that to an employer, right, as a portfolio or as a document. It's too much. Take it to an interview. And as soon as they say, so I, I see that you explored, I don't know, model making. You can go, actually, uh, guys, yeah, I, I did look at model making and I did this massive study for you and and actually show them when you're presenting your work as well as your portfolio take along key documents you've gone to a hell of a lot of effort to pr produce these 100 page beasts so take them along with you if it's not too much and um, again you don't want to be lugging about you know big a1s and things you know that that's ludicrous but yeah take up take along key examples of your work and even if you don't speak about them in an interview, have them sat next to you out on the table in front of an employer because guaranteed they will be impressed by that because you're showing that you're prepared to expand on your work. Um, I think I think that's uh, everything. That was a really good point, Erin, actually. Uh, so point well made. Um, you're also saying about your design report, absolutely. Yeah, that's a, that's a definite. Okay, um, now if I can, just building on one of the um, questions about using your year out work. Um, again, guys, this is work that I've done in practice So since I've been graduated. So don't, you know, kind of take this with a pinch of salt, but also bang that in your portfolio. You know, if, if you've done a nice sketch study of, of something for your, your practice, get that in. I would say, Work in practice is really good because it's concise. Your uni stuff's big projects. It's much easier to select work that you've done in practice because it's generally smaller stints. You'll notice with this example, again, I'm not saying it's, it's the best in the world, but it clearly shows an overview of the project, details of what that project was about, that I've used Revit modeling, that I've been able to sketch the sections. So again, in what... 10 images over two pages, you're showing that you're Revit proficient, that you're sketch proficient. You can work some form of Photoshop Illustrator to do diagrams and you can sketch. That's it. That, that's the game. That, that is as simple as it gets. Um, and again, yeah, a little bit of text just introducing the project. Um, we annotations saying that you, you know, what the project was, yeah, get them on. That that's fine. If you've got little bits of annotation that are sketched, fine. Um, I would actually draw attention to the to this being a Revit model. If I was applying for a job and I saw Revit proficiency and I've got Revit examples, I would be noting actually in there 
uh, Revit model, uh, yeah, produced using X plugin, whatever. Um, another example, um, again, a snapshot. You've done the sketch design, you've shown it in context, you've shown how you've modeled it, you've then shown the visuals. That, that's it. That, that is as simple as it needs to be. It's just concept, working drawings, or nice versions of working drawings, and then what it looks like. That, that is, <laughs> that's as easy as it gets. So Sophie's saying, would you include photos of a project that you didn't design but worked on on site? Yes, but be careful with your photographs. If you didn't design it, I wouldn't be showing concept images. If you produce those concept images, by all means, yeah. Because in an interview, you would say, um, under direction from the uh, studio principal, I, I was tasked with coming up with really concise uh, diagrams to show this project. Brilliant. Tick in the box. Um, if you didn't do them, then you're bullshitting. <laughs> so, you know, be careful. Um, Ross is saying, what about university group work? Yeah, again, university group work, get it in. I used a lot of um, university group work in my third year portfolio when I was applying for my year out because I didn't do very well in my uh, in, in my general work. And what's really good about the group work is, you, you know, you're not saying that you produced it all. You're just saying group project and then you can expand on it. Um, so, yeah, it's uh, it's really just a case of be honest, but also own own your shit. You know, if you've done something really well, show it, get it in. Um, I suppose. Yeah, just just looking at those examples, just be clear, initial sketch design, easy for everybody to see as a community centre with flats above. You've shown it um, how it builds up, how it then gets modelled. Um, draw attention to the fact that you used a software to do it. I, I haven't there. That That's maybe something that could have been done better. And then, yeah, uh, this was a plugin for Revit called Twin Motion. Again, draw attention to the fact that you've used a new software. Um, and yeah, you can talk for days about that on uh, in an interview setting. So just, just to cap off, pick your best examples of your work, okay? Be selective. Um, yeah, don't fill your portfolio with the same things. If you've got a really good example of something, loads of them, pick the best. OK, the employers are looking for you to be concise. Um, yeah, try and show your workflow. I know that it's difficult if you're in third year and you're picking examples from first, second, third. Try and show that you've worked through a project, through concepts to final proposal and the in-between. As I say, it's easier to do that in fourth and fifth year because you have year-long projects. So. And um, yeah, if for a third year portfolio, just just pick your best, best examples. Um, as I was saying, have an application portfolio for initial applications that's quite short and concise. Have a separate interview portfolio that you print off and you proudly take to an interview and it expands on everything that you've shown. Because your employer will often, uh, or interviewer will print off your portfolio and they'll notice that you've brought a load of other stuff to talk about and they'll go, well, I've seen this. So talk about talk about your new stuff that you've brought uh, and make sure anything you do bring that you're confident to speak about it. Part one portfolio is all about snapshots of work. A good model, a, a good uh, a good piece of CAD, um, a good bit of Revit. Uh, I actually use some of Rev, um, Richie's tutorials in my early portfolios because you've worked through a, a process and it's your work and you know but you've you've kind of been steered and, and it's something that looks quite professional or can part two portfolio is more about telling a story as concisely as possible because the employer is looking for you to ultimately do that um, under their name 
make your portfolio adjustable and flexible. You'll have pieces that you'll speak about uh, for one application that might not be relevant to another. And if it's not relevant, take it out for goodness sake. Um, yeah, it's not reinventing the wheel. If you've got a base file and a template, you can just dip in and out of it and, uh, and, and export as and when. Um, yeah, look at what you value and what you're good at. Do you enjoy model making? And look at practices that are into model making. Um, don't go and work for a you know a developer, for goodness sake. If if it's model making that you that you're really into, because you'll have a crap year. So as much as it's about getting an employment opportunity, it's about finding the right um, employment opportunity. Um, it really is that simple, guys. Um, now, finally, if I may, I'll just speak about job applications. Um, just to give you a rough overview. Now, I'm conscious that you had a year out lecture last Friday. So this will maybe build on that. I might be repeating a couple of things, but yeah, look on Instagram. I know that ADAS is really good now at posting links for part ones and part twos. Great, use that. If you like an architecture practice, go on their page and stalk them. Honestly, look at their uh, work every couple of weeks, check their careers section, and check when they're hiring. Um, hiring times, as I'll draw attention to later, are generally when there's crossover. So when the outgoing part ones from their year out are leaving, they'll be looking to replace them. So uh, don't worry too much about getting a job at the start of summer, because you'll notice a lot of good opportunities go up towards the end of summer when that year are, are moving back to uni and, and you guys are the, the year out year. Ask people, honestly, guys, I can't stress this enough. I got every opportunity that I've had so far has been based on knowing someone. Uh, my most recent job, uh, the guy was my um, external examiner. And I linked in, I said, hi, I don't know if you uh, remember me, but um, you know, I'm really interested in the stuff that you guys do. Is there anything going? Or can we have a chat? Or can you put me in touch with someone? It just shows that you're willing, okay? Um, reach out to graduates, uh, ping me a message, ping uh, the next guest speaker a message. You know, use your network. If you've been inspired by someone, tell them. Just send them a message and say, hey, I hope you don't mind. I thought what you said uh, last Friday was great. I thought the examples that you showed were brilliant. How can I get a similar experience? And you'll be surprised at the amount of people that will help you. As I say, they'll be so willing to assist you. And yeah, people don't bite. Use your contacts. Um, yeah, you, I just can't emphasize that enough. So when you're looking online, RIBA Jobs is a really good site. Uh, the R RIAS, they have a jobs site. So that's specifically jobs in Scotland. Um, Urban Realm as well. Um, Scottish Jobs, you'll get posted on that. The RIBA are really good for getting your established firms, especially London and things. And, you know, if you're not necessarily wanting a job in architecture, you can do your year out at an interior firm or a planning firm. Um, it's maybe just a little bit harder to get the job because you'll be competing with people that have those specific degrees. Uh, LinkedIn, can't tell you enough. Message people, honestly. And, uh, and design jobs is, is a good one. Uh, and then finally, guys, I'll just round off on this because I'm conscious that I'm eating into your evening and, uh, and yeah, I don't want to take up any more of your time. Uh, but yeah, read the job advertisement really carefully. Try and work out what you're interested in and how it matches the practice and tailor those applications that you're really interested in. Um, if you need a cover letter, keep it concise and to the point. Look up examples of them and, and structure them based on examples online. Um, use forums as well for that. Um, use the job description. Uh, basically, say the job description back to them in a way that shows that you are qualified for the job. Um, yeah, again, back to the first point, read the job description. 
there will be portfolio size limits, there will be experience requirements, there will be desired qualities. If you don't meet them, you could spend two and a half hours doing it or a day doing a great application, but it doesn't meet the desired qualities. So the first thing they'll do is chuck it in the bin. So make sure that the job that you're applying for, you are um, capable of doing and you are qualified for doing. Um, be prepared, as we said, to, to talk about your portfolio and CV. And aim high, guys, honestly, go for experiences. Go abroad when you're uh, when you're on your year out. I didn't because I had loads of mates that were moving into fourth year that were medics and lawyers that I wanted to hang out with. And I wanted to have a wee bit of money on my year out and go out with them to liquid on a Wednesday night and think that I was brilliant. You guys, you know, if you want to go traveling, go and do it. Do six months somewhere and then, you know, do six months around Europe. Go and work six months um, elsewhere, you know, use the opportunity. The year out isn't about 12 months of hard graft and stupid hours. It's about establishing what you are good at, what you can improve on, and becoming a rounded student for when you come back to fourth year and you can hit it hard, okay? I make no bones of the fact I was a pretty terrible student in second year, third year, I I, I got a bit burnt out in first year. I probably tried too hard. Um, second and third year, I was more about going out and having a good time for me. When you come back for fourth year, there is no messing about. So use your year out as an opportunity to get experience, but to also find out what you enjoy. Um, and take the time before you come back for a really tough year in fourth year. Uh, to enjoy that year out. I, I know a lot of people that worked for great companies, but they had a miserable time. Don't have a miserable time on your year out, guys. It's, it's not worth it. And uh, I've said this before, always, always, always read, reread and reread the application because the employer puts in loads and loads of clues um, to tell you specifically what they're looking for. And... Uh, and yeah, I, I do have uh, extra slides if anyone's interested on cover letters. But uh, but for now, I think you know you guys will be desperate to go and get your dinner. So I'll uh, I'll leave it at that. Uh, questions, guys, go for it because um, you know it's your opportunity to use. Uh, so thanks again for the opportunity, and hopefully you've maybe taken something out of this. That was great, Fraser. Thank you very much. Um, I can see that we do have a few questions uh, in the chat if you want to open that up for yourself. Yeah, cool. Can you actually see these uh, when I open them up on the chat? No, we, we no, just see the PowerPoint, so you're okay. Cool, okay, because <laughs> I'm conscious as uh, covering half the screen. Um, okay, so I think it's, is that Erin's question? Yeah, so Erin, you're saying if you apply at the end of third year, should you use your second semester project to tell a story? Yes, I, I would. If if you think it it's it does the job. Again, if you if you don't think you've had a particularly good second semester, draw attention to the work that you think is best. Uh, you know, if you think certain projects kind of sell you in a in a way, use them. Um, it's all about using the portfolio to show your best work. You know, it's it's not about anything else, really. Um, hopefully that answers that. Should you apply as early as you can? Yeah, see, that point, Erin, I get where a lot of people are at, where they're thinking, God, I need to get a job. You really, I would be careful, okay? Number one, you've just done third year. You've probably had a pretty stressful last couple of months. Um, you want to take a bit of time out, albeit you might not be able to go on holiday in the COVID situation, but that's by the by. Take the time out to recharge, and then I would hit your applications start of summer, maybe, um, middle of summer, preferably, end of summer, fine, absolutely fine. As I say, uh, part ones generally will stay on until about a month before they go back to uni. Uh, last time I checked, Dundee went back to uni in September. I think most unis go back September, October. That means that part ones will be finishing in August time. 
So a lot of employment opportunities will come up and you might find yourself with a great portfolio and you've jumped at the first opportunity and you're, you're thinking, oh, goodness, I've missed an opportunity to work for, I don't know, Hoskins, big, you know, um, a really cool design firm because you missed that opportunity. Um, similarly on that point in the wedding, I know that a lot of um, practices abroad hire internships um, and they generally hire about now. I've seen a few uh, Danish firms uh, putting up job adverts around now. You might have to apply for them now if, if you want to get them. Okay, hopefully that, that helps. Um, we've got one here saying what would you say about using agencies yeah so agencies look if you're having a torrid time uh, with applications there's nothing wrong with an agency just be mindful that you'll see a lot of particularly the the goods practices or the considered design practices they'll say in their careers page we specifically do not hire from agencies and that is because they're wanting people that are number one, seeking them out. So they're interested in them. And number two, they're wanting, they know that they're, they're a good, they're a big deal. So they don't need to go to an agency. Agencies will generally be used when uh, companies are bigger and they need to fill up spots or, uh, or the company uh, is really struggling to hire someone. Now, that's not a bad thing because you might end up going to one of these companies and really enjoying it because they put a lot of responsibility on you or, you know, you might find that they are a design based firm. They just maybe don't have the, the reach that these kind of cooler considered firms have. But I would be wary on your year out for agencies. I know a lot of people that use recruiters when they graduate. Uh, for me, that's a different story because that's about using a recruiter to find you a specific job uh, as a graduate. As a part one, I don't think you've got as much um, gravitas. I don't think you've got as much uh, ability to say, oh, I want that job because you're, you, you just don't have the experience unless you're a, you know, silver medal winner, <laughs> you know, type thing or, uh, you know, your RIBA uh, shortlisted or whatever. Yeah, I, I would say maybe, um, yeah, maybe leave them. Um, Scandinavian companies are usually quite early. Yeah, that's right, Sophie. I, I actually tried to go to Denmark when I graduated. I, I loved the place. I went on a study trip in fourth year uh, for ASD and autism, which I think is still going as a project in fourth year. Um, and I, I thought Denmark was brilliant and I fell in love with the place, but I didn't do my due diligence. I didn't check when they took in applicants and I fell foul of putting too much work into my final year. Although I, I, I did really well, all the rest of it, I had time in January if I'd known about applying. Um, and we, well, we're still in February now. So if you're really interested in going to like a, Holland or Denmark, apply, uh, start looking now at those firms. As I say, stock them on Instagram, stock the companies that you like on uh, on Architecture Daily, um, send them your CV, send them your portfolio. I am conscious though that you won't have these things to hand yet and you've got a lot on. So it is a big undertaking, but well worth it. And I would say an opportunity that I certainly missed was uh, was getting an internship at a, a Danish firm um, six months before graduating, I, just because I, I didn't do the uh, the research. So, um, likewise, guys, if you've got any questions about uh, even the process, I know that this has been about specifically job applications and a uh, workshop and uh, workshops, goodness, um, about CVs and portfolios. If you've got general questions about the year out, um, yeah, go for it.
if there's anything else come through Ross as well or Glenn just let me know uh, but otherwise guys uh, really appreciate your attention I'm aware that uh, you know it, it might have been a, a little bit wordy what I was saying but um, but yeah hopefully it's clear uh, Jay's just come in saying what do you say when they ask if you have any more questions oh really good point always ask a question um, and have it planned so um, the types of questions that are good to ask what a question is good for is showing that you have done your due diligence on a practice and also it's about your opportunity to quiz them it's like flipping the interview so uh, something that you might ask is uh, I noticed that you you have a really vibrant social um, calendar a lot of the London firms do to set them apart can you tell me a bit more about that um, or you might say um, I'm really into uh, photography is there an opportunity within the practice to explore this or um, or get training uh, that's a good one because you're asking you know what they can do for you um, ask about sketch classes if you're into that ask about life drawing if, if that's an interest of you uh, of, of yours rather um, another thing you could ask about is uh, is actually how they've adjusted to COVID now. I know that's a bit cliche, but um, it's interesting to see that different practices, or rather to hear that different practices have approached things differently. Um, and it's often a good gauge to see where an employer is at and really if they're right for you. So have a couple of questions in the back of your mind. Uh, on that, don't be afraid to take notes in. Um, to a uh, to an interview because that just shows that you're prepared. Taking notes in doesn't mean that you're you know really nervous and all over the place about an application. It means that you're you know your shit. You know what you want to ask. Get the questions down. And um, if they ask you a question, just say, oh, "Hang on, I'll just take a note of that so that I don't get uh, caught up in what I'm saying." Doing all these things is more than valid and actually just shows that you're conscientious. Um, Erin saying is it good to phone up a practice after applying to show interest yeah although I would be cautious Erin that you you'll gauge by the interview how it went unless you've, you've just not got a handle of people uh, you should know if it's went okay if it's been a disaster or if it's been quite positive if it's been really positive I would say yeah phone them I wouldn't phone for the sake of phoning. I would phone if you say, actually, I've I've had a an idea. I've had a, there was a question that I meant to ask. Could you could you help me with this? Or um, you might have a, a genuine question about, um, you know, um, when do you employ people? Or it, it might be that you have uh, aspects of an offer that you're unsure about. Um, yeah, I would phone up, but I, I would never say, if you've not heard back from an interview, number one is pretty bad practice. If if someone's gone to the bother of interviewing you and then not telling you whether you got the job or not, I would say you wouldn't want to join that practice personally. It could be an admin error though. And if you are really hell bent on that experience and that practice, phone them up and say, Hi, I, I I just noticed that you know it's been a little while since I heard. I would only do that for an interview though. I would never do it after sending them a portfolio because they'll they'll get hundreds or thousands even. So, um, how long would you wait before calling again? I personally have never had to call someone, and I don't mean that as in they've always called me. I mean that as in an employer after interviewing you, unless they're just useless will we'll always get in touch with you if it's good bad or otherwise um it is nice as as i say if you've got a burning question or you got a feel off of one of the interviewers that you know oh, I, I could really chat to them about something just to show that i'm interested a bit more by all means do it but yeah i would say be very selective about that kind of thing
that seems to be all the questions that are coming through. Guys, have you got anything else? Um, yeah, just fire away, honestly. I'm I am also really conscious that no one's spoken other than Ross and I, so <laughs> apologies if uh, if I've been a bit too uh, kind of um, too much and, and spoken for too long, but hopefully it's given you a, a good gauge. If you're unsure about things and you just aren't confident in asking a question in the chat or whatever, um, drop me a message on LinkedIn, uh, connect on LinkedIn and, you know, uh, I, I'll help in any way I can or try and put you uh, in, in contact with someone um, if they can help. Um, yeah, that's that's been really, really good, Fraser. Thank you so much for um, all the work you put into preparing this. 